afternoon. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our latest installment of Beyond the Ballot, the series where we look at the key national security and foreign policy challenges facing either a second Trump administration or an incoming Biden administration. And there is no one that I think would be better to have on this week than Brian Hook. Brian Hook, as everybody knows from the bio, has had an extensive career in government. We were just chatting before we came on and I learned something new about Brian that he actually interned for President Bush 41. He then went on to serve in a variety of senior roles in the Bush 43 administration, including, and I'm having to use my glasses for this because we've got so much details, serving as Assistant Secretary of State for International Organizations, Senior Advisor to the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, and Special Assistant to the President for Policy in the Bush administration. He has recently just stepped down from serving as Senior Advisor and the United States Iran Envoy for Secretary of State Pompeo, and he had also served as Director of the Policy Planning Staff when Rex Tillerson was Secretary of State. So he is an individual that has served basically for all the recent presidents. He is the real expert on Republican foreign policy. So the first question I really wanted to ask you, Brian, is I wanted to ask you about sort of how you came to basically your latest role as being the US Iran envoy, you know, how challenging it was to sort of take on this position. You weren't necessarily the architect of the maximum pressure policy, but you were the one who basically had to execute that policy. So if you could talk a little bit about biography and about your role on Iran, that would be fantastic. Well, thanks, Halima, and really good to be with you today. Uh, so I started at the State Department when uh, Rex Tillerson hired me, and I started about the same time he did, shortly after the administration took office. And in that role, I ran the Office of Policy Planning, and that was the office that was started by George Kennan and the same office that uh, created the Marshall Plan. And so um, that, that is kind of what's known as the State Department's think tank. And you've had people like Richard Haas and um, a, a number uh, of people over the, over the many decades that have served in that role. Um, Rex Tillerson decided to make that the policy switchboard of the State Department. And so we were responsible with pulling together all of the strategies uh, for the first uh, year and a half of the administration, and that included the Iran strategy. Uh, we were inside the Iran deal at the time, and so the maximum pressure campaign really wasn't possible, which we'll, we can talk about in more detail later. But then when Mike Pompeo became Secretary of State, uh, he asked me to uh, be the U.S. Special Representative for Iran. Now, for, for Mike Pompeo, Iran has been a a kind of signature issue for him. When he was in the House of Representatives, Iran was his number one national security issue when he was on the House Intelligence Committee. When he was CIA director, he stood up um, an Iran mission center and made that a focus. And so I guess it was rather natural that when he became uh, Secretary of State, the first appointment, uh, the first envoy he created was for Iran. And so that's how the whole uh, relationship started. Well, can you talk where you see Iran now? I mean, you ha the president had sort of the 13 points in terms of what he was expecting to see from Iran in terms of a change of behavior. Where do you think Iran is now in terms of their actions in the region? How much do you think sanctions have you know, impacted their policy? And you know, how serious is the economic crisis in Iran at the moment because of sanctions? Well, always remember when we talk about Iran that we are still talking about the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism, and they are also the world's leading state sponsor of anti-Semitism. So this is a regime that for 41 years has been chanting death to America and death to Israel. We have had a number of very tense moments in our 41-year history, and we've always had sanctions on Iran going back to uh, Jimmy Carter. This president, President Trump, has put in place a level, a sanctions regime that has no precedent in America's 41 year history with Iran. I'll give you one example. President Rouhani said that America's sanctions have cost Iran $200 billion. And we have only been out of the Iran deal for about um, a year and a half. 
And so the president put in place extraordinary levels uh, of pressure. And as a consequence, uh, Iran is facing its worst economic crisis in its 41 year history. In November, there were massive protests in all 31 of Iran's provinces. It was the worst political unrest that, that the Iranian regime has ever experienced. They're facing a crisis of legitimacy and credibility with their own people. And so right now, I think all of Iran's options are bad. The one thing that they're hoping for is that President Trump does not get reelected. Um, this is, uh, but it, you know, if the, if the president does win his reelect, I think the regime is going to be in a very difficult position. I don't believe that they can weather four more years of this kind of pressure. Uh, it's going to be very challenging for them. And so I think um, the incentives for them are going to increase because I think it's an open question whether um, they're going to be able to survive this kind of pressure, whether they have the resistance to uh, overcome the pressure that's been put in place on them economically. So recently there has been reports that we've seen an increase in Iranian export volumes on the market. Is this an indicate, first of all, do you, are you hearing the same? And if so, is that an indication that Iran has become good at adapting to the sanctions regime and has found a way to circumvent them? We have made enforcing sanctions a priority. And so, as I mentioned earlier, other, other, other administrations have had sanctions. No one has had sanctions at this scale and no one has enforced them to this extent. And as a consequence, we have collapsed, largely collapsed Iran's energy sector. Iran uh, accounts for about 3% of the world's oil supply. When we got out of the Iran deal in May of 2018, Iran was exporting 2.7 million barrels of oil a day. And uh, I remember and within about a year and a half or so, um, we had taken those volumes uh, down to two and 300,000 barrels. And so China has been uh, the country that's been violating sanctions and they've been importing a certain uh, number of barrels, somewhere between two and 300,000 barrels. Uh, but that is nowhere near the levels that China was importing. Think about this. You had about 25 countries that were importing Iranian crude oil and all 25 of those have gone to zero. We have uh, the, the United States Trump administration sanctioned China uh, for importing uh, Iranian crude oil. And I think in a second term, you're going to continue to see vigorous enforcement of, of oil sanctions. Also sanctions around petrochem, minerals. Um, we have added, uh, the Trump administration has added more banks to the blacklist. Um, as soon as the UN arms embargo expired on Iran recently. So you're going to continue to see enormous pressure by the United States on Iran's energy sector and its banking sector. And those are the two principal drivers of their export revenue. I'm just going to stick with Iran just for one more moment, and then I'm, we're going to change topics. I wanted to ask you, you know, we had a speaker last week. We had Michael Morrell, former acting director of the CIA, former deputy director, and he essentially said that regardless of whether it's a Biden administration or a second Trump administration, you're likely to get a deal with Iran. And he said from the standpoint of a second Trump administration, it would likely be done simply because Iran was facing so much economic pressure that they could not sustain maximum resistance. And then you hear from Iranian officials where they essentially say, no, we are still resilient. I mean, what do you think is the actual prospect of a, a deal in a second Trump administration? And what would a, what does a diplomatic off ramp with Iran actually look like? I think Mike Morell is probably right. Uh, my expectation is that at some point in the next four years, there will be a deal with the Iranian regime and the deals will look very different, uh, most likely. But I think the fundamental premise is correct. You mentioned, Halima, the diplomatic off-ramps. President Trump has been offering diplomatic off-ramps to the Iranian regime since 2017. And the regime has almost systematically rejected every diplomatic off-ramp. And that's been to the detriment of the Iranian people. Uh, the president, I remember at his first UN speech, said that the longest suffering victims of the Iranian regime are its own people. And so while the administration has had in place 
this campaign of maximum economic pressure, diplomatic isolation, the credible threat of military force to defend America's uh, interests, and also standing with the Iranian people. Uh, that was Standing with the Iranian people was not a feature of the Obama administration. This administration has made it uh, a, a hallmark of our foreign policy. I think that would continue in a second term. Um, President Trump, I remember saying maybe a month ago, believes that uh, the Iranian regime will come to the table uh, shortly after his re-election. And uh, I, I, I think that there, there probably will be a deal. It's going to be around Iran's nuclear program. It's got to be better than the deal that the Obama administration struck. I think the right standard is no enrichment. One of the questions that I would get as the Iran envoy is, how close, you know, Iran seems to be getting closer to a nuclear weapon. And I would say that the question illustrates the problem. Iran should not be enriching nuclear material. You can't have the world's leading sponsor of terrorism enriching fissile material. So I think a new deal will have something on the nuclear piece, the missile piece, and the regional aggression. Well, I want to now follow up or actually pivot to the subject of China. Uh, we just had the announcement of new sanctions on Chinese entities for continuing to provide you know, economic assistance or work with the Iranian regime. A key theme throughout this entire series has been about the real challenge that great, well, great power competition between the US and China. Almost every speaker has really talked about rivalry with China as like the most important foreign policy challenge for the coming decades. How do you see the bilateral relationship between the US and China? And then I wanna follow on with the sort of Indo-Pacific strategy that Pompeo has laid out. You're right. I think that there is, uh, we have a very divided nation, but on the subject of China, uh, there is a lot of unity. And this is something which is going to continue uh, across administrations. It was 50 years ago this year that Kissinger first went to China. And at the time, I remember uh, Richard Nixon wrote a piece in Foreign Affairs where he talked about that we need to induce change in China and to help influence events. And he decided to help open China uh, to the rest of the world. And I think we've now had, uh, you know, following Nixon, you had a series of administrations that all wanted to encourage China's rise, to open it up to the world. And the theory of the case is that as, as China became more prosperous, it would lead to greater freedoms for the Chinese people, but also that China would be, um, would have an economic incentive to be a good neighbor and to be in a common phrase over the last decades, a responsible stakeholder in the international community. Uh, we've now had 50 years of experience uh, since Kissinger went to China. Nixon at one point later in his life worried that perhaps by opening up China, he had created what he calls a Frankenstein. And you have a lot of Americans uh, right now after, you know, they, China covered up the outbreak in Wuhan, um, the the awful trade practices that have hollowed out America's manufacturing. Um, you've had a number of things around um, the, the theft of intellectual property, um, the currency manipulation, the, the, the military buildup, uh, China's lack of respect for freedom of navigation. Uh, a lot of these issues, their behavior in Hong Kong, uh, you now have, I think, when President Trump came into office, you know, he talked a lot about China when he was campaigning. And in his national security strategy, it really was a departure with the last 47 years. I think you could say the president did a U-turn on China, that we were not going to be blindly engaging with China any longer. And so uh, he's looking at China in a very different way. And I think that there's bipartisan support for that. And as I look at it, you've got principles. There are certain principles that I think are going to endure for a very long time. Fairness and reciprocity. That's got to be core to American foreign policy with China. Uh, playing by the rules, transparency. Um, you know, China, when they say win-win, it means two wins for China. When we say win-win, it's an entirely different uh, formula. And China needs to, uh, I, I think, rise uh, in a way that isn't at the expense 
of the rules-based international order. And you look at how countries like India have risen. They've risen very responsibly. I think that's a much better model for the world. That's the largest democracy in the world. China has risen at the expense of the United States. Um, I know I was a part of the high-level dialogues that started at the beginning of the administration. And China has perfected the art of the high-level dialogue, which is a lot of process and a lot of talk, but very little results. And I think going forward, you are going to see an American relationship with China that is constructive and results-based. It's got to be results-based, and it's got to be fair, and there have to be reciprocal actions. If China is, 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 is sort of keeping American investment away while we open our markets to China, while they're doing the forced joint ventures, the intellectual property theft, the range of issues that I think we're all aware of, um, we need to reciprocate and we need to hold China accountable. And the good news is I think more nations around the world have followed the president's leadership on China. We very much need to have a system of alliances that holds China accountable. So you talked about the continuity between now Democrats and Republicans on the issue of China. And I think you know that's something that's really come through in this speaker series. Can you talk though about how you think a second Trump administration or a Biden administration, I mean, if they diagnose the problem the same way, how do you think the policies would differ on China? I haven't, I've been in, I, you know, just recently out of the State Department. And so it has been, um, I have not had time to study <clears throat> the Biden approach uh, if, he, if he were to be elected president. Um, but I think what you're going to see uh, in, in, in the second term of a Trump administration, uh, you're going to see, in, um, you're going to have phase two uh, of the trade talks. Uh, and, in, and, you know, we have tariffs in place and those tariffs are going to continue uh, until there is a phase two. You're going to see a, an insistence on fair trade. You're going to see a lot of reciprocal actions taking place. The president will be taking cases uh, to, the, to the WTO, enforcing um, anti-dumping laws and uh, countervailing duties, uh, stronger IP protections. Uh, we are going, you know, our military... Uh, you see this in the national defense strategy uh, that was offered at the uh, was authored at the beginning of the administration. We have 375,000 troops in the Indo-Pacific, and that includes 200 war uh, 200 ships. I think five of those um, are part of uh, aircraft uh, uh, strike groups. So we are very heavily postured uh, in the Indo-Pacific. That's going to continue. Uh, the secretaries of defense that I've worked with in this administration all understand uh, China's military expansion, its buildup, and uh, the, the Trump administration, I think, will continue to do freedom of navigation uh, operations, joint military exercises. Um, there'll be a range of those things. And so I think it'll be, we, we, we kind of have seen a lot of, of President Trump's approach to China uh, that was first articulated in the national security strategy that we are in a period of great power competition. Competition does not mean conflict or confrontation. And I think that's going to be the sort of the art of statecraft is being in a competition and avoiding uh, confrontation and conflict with China because it's not in either country's interests uh, for us to get into conflict. So am I hearing you right that you don't subscribe then to the Thucydides trap? You don't believe, as Graham Allison has laid out, that there's a real risk when you have an established power and a rising power of conflict. I mean, what is it going to take to potentially avoid conflict? I mean, are there things that you are concerned about that you could have a sort of unintended escalation through miscalculation? Is it an issue like Taiwan? Is it South China Seas? Like, what could be the, the tripwire for something you say that everybody wants to avoid? I have a lot of confidence in American diplomacy. And if you look at um, the, the, the couple hundred years of American diplomacy, uh, you know, we've had two hot wars and a cold war in Europe. And America was the indispensable nation uh, in all three. And I have so much confidence in the durability of our institutions and in the quality of our statesmen. And uh, I think that's going to continue. And I'm, I, I believe that we'll be able to successfully uh, 
sort of uh, uphold America, America's ideals and interests uh, with China. I think a lot of that has to be, you know, China, China has a tendency of essentially through its predatory economics of creating a kind of dependency on their economy. And then once that dependency is created, it starts to change people's behavior. And China doesn't like it when people call them out for their human rights abuses or their economic practices. And it causes China very often is able to effectively buy people's silence. And one of the questions I think people have to ask is that when China is trying to change someone's behavior in a certain direction, ask yourself, like, what if the United States government did what China's doing? How would I react to that? And I think in most cases, it's something that we would never agree to do. And so as we look ahead, I think not only governments, but people around the world, freedom-loving nations around the world, have to uphold the ideals uh, of freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, um, playing by the rules of the game, fairness. These are some of the very basic principles that I think we need to really champion and uh, insist on in all of our bilateral relations with China. So I think if we're able to do that, I think we're gonna be able to manage a lot of the tensions. We have to be open. We have to be open to having a lot of friction in uh, our bilateral relations. But that means defending our principles. The President Trump, his foreign policy, he describes as principled realism. And this is the principled part. And the concentration camps in Xinjiang is something which is outrageous and should offend the sensibilities of all freedom-loving nations. And we need to say it, for, uh, call it out for what it is and stand up for the Uyghurs. And when China starts committing human rights abuses in various places, we have to call it out. So I think I'm hopeful that that is something which is bipartisan. And I think that as when America leads defending these principles that I just described, we will bring others along with us. And I think that'll be critical in places like the Indo-Pacific. Okay, so again, to sort of like that, to nail you down, you don't really see there as like a, a tripwire. You don't, it's not something that keeps you up at night. You don't think that, for example, if there was to be a competition, you don't, or a conflict, you're not saying it's Taiwan. Like you just don't see a potential military confrontation with China on the cards under any circumstances. I think that we need to have, uh, be very clear eyed about the risks in the South China Sea and very clear eyed about Taiwan as a flashpoint, a potential flashpoint. And uh, okay. as you just said, those, those are two places that I keep a very close eye on. Okay. So what about now North Korea? You spent a lot of time working on North Korea as head of the policy planning staff. Where, how do we assess now the North Korean threat in terms of their nuclear arsenal, the leadership? How critical is China to getting some type of solution to North Korea? Is, is a solution even possible? And what would the terms of that look like? When we came into office, I remember the headlines, which was, is there going to be war again on the Korean Peninsula? And they had done nuclear tests and they were um, doing a lot of missile tests. And I was um, part of the team that put together uh, our strategy coming into office on North Korea. Uh, the real tragedy of North Korea is that the 1994 agreed framework of the Clinton administration did not stop North Korea from acquiring a nuclear weapon. And one of the things that I worry about with Iran is that if you want to see how the movie with Iran ends, take a look at North Korea. Um, the Iran nuclear deal uh, was designed by many of the same people that designed the 1994 uh, non-proliferation accord with North Korea. And it put North Korea on a pathway. Once a, a, a sort of hermit kingdom like North Korea gets a nuclear bomb, um, it is very hard. Um, your, your option set, all the options are bad. And so we never want to get to that place with Iran because unlike North Korea, you know, Iran, North Korea is a hermit kingdom. Iran is an international um, country. I mean, it has, uh, it's, it's been around for 25 centuries. This is a very serious country that has a lot of reach and power projection. And, you 
we can never allow Iran to get a nuclear weapon. And that's why the president got out of the Iran deal, because he thinks that we're better positioned to prevent that from happening than being inside the deal. So on North Korea, um, we decided to put pressure in place, but to keep the door open for dialogue. And the president has had uh, two or three meetings now <clears throat> with Chairman Kim. I was with Secretary Pompeo on his first trip uh, to Pyongyang. And we, were, we went there and we were able to negotiate the release of three Americans who um, uh, are free today. And they're no longer living in a North Korean prison. And that's a very good thing. I would say, you look at where we were when we came into office with headlines about a potential war and where we are today, I think the dialogue uh, and the diplomacy the president undertook, which doesn't have any precedent with the Kim family, is historic. And we have, the tensions now are not what they were when we came into office. And so I think that's a significant accomplishment. Uh, we have not, the, the administration has not achieved its objective of essentially sanctions relief and normalization in exchange for denuclearization. But we have a much, I think, better understanding of each other. Um, you had Steve Began appointed as a special envoy. Uh, the president with his meetings with uh, Kim Jong-un have all been, you know, there was a deal that was on the table. President didn't think it was good enough uh, and walked away from it, but he still kept the channels open. So I think for as long as we're able to present a vision for North Korea that we think is a better vision for not only Kim Jong-un, but also for the uh, North Korean people, I think that's a positive. And we just need to keep managing tensions there as best we can. Just sticking with North Korea for one more moment, Mike Morrell last week said that what concerned him the most about North Korea was that North Korea sells everything. And he actually thinks that the, the real proliferation risk for North Korea is that they're simply gonna sell their nuclear materials. Is that something that you're concerned about in terms of like where the risk lies with North Korea? North Korea has a long history of doing exactly what you just described, Lima. A lot of Iran's missile program is um, North Korean origin. And Iran has been able to develop an indigenous missile capability by improving uh, a lot of North Korea's um, missile platforms. So North Korea is a proliferator. Uh, we, the Trump administration has done what it can to try to uh, curb that proliferation. It's important that that work continue. Um, we, have, we have had a very good non-proliferation team at the State Department uh, for some time. I think DOD, State, Department of Energy, uh, we have a, there's a very good interagency team that's focused on exactly the kind of proliferation threat that you described, whether it's on the nuclear piece or the, or the missile piece. And so this is a policy of vigilance and dialogue that you have to have uh, with North Korea. And we need to put in place sanctions as a deterrent when it's needed. And we also need to keep engaging with North Korea. Uh, engagement is something which I think it'll be hard to say in coming years um, whether you'll continue to have the President of the United States <clears throat> and the Chairman continue to have dialogue. Um, I do think that it has reduced tensions on the Korean Peninsula. And I think that's been a big contribution the President has made to de-escalating uh, tensions there. We have to be very clear-eyed about North Korea's history that Mike Morrell understands very well. And I think across administrations, you're going to continue to see a very tight focus on it. Now, before we turn to my colleague, Baraj Bokatera from our great energy equity team, I wanted to talk about your really, you know, quite historic diplomatic breakthroughs in the Middle East. I mean, you are really credited with, you know, really leading the effort to have the normalization of relations between UAE and Israel and Bahrain and Israel. So if you could talk about sort of what you see as the importance of that agreement. And I had a follow on question that was sent to me about Saudi Arabia and why is Saudi Arabia outside of the agreement? And what do you think it would take to bring Saudi into this broader, you know, resetting of relations in the Middle East? So on the first question about the Abraham Accords, um, <clears throat> that, that was very exciting to be a, <clears throat> pardon me, it was very exciting to be a part of that. I started working with Jared Kushner on a 
vision for peace between Israel and, and the Palestinians. And we started on that very early in the, in the administration. We also put in place an Iran strategy um, that ended up playing a very critical role in the uh, peace agreements that were signed with UAE, Israel, and Bahrain. And so over a couple of years, we put together a vision for peace. And it was out of that vision that you kind of had the organic raw material emerge for a peace agreement with UAE, and then uh, within 30 days, a peace agreement with Bahrain. Uh, when I was in the Oval Office, after the president did his, um, his phone call with the King of Bahrain and with Prime Minister Netanyahu, I had said to the press that historians will remember these two agreements as the beginning of the end of the Arab-Israeli conflict. And when you look at the Middle East today, it is not the Middle East of, of, of sort of what it's been from 1947 forward. You look in places like Iran, two thirds of the Iranian people were born after the revolution. You look in places like Saudi and UAE, Bahrain, Lebanon, so many of the young people there um, are tired of this conflict and they're tired of the role that religion has played in sectarian violence in the Middle East. They don't see why the Arab-Israeli conflict should be a conflict. And UAE, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, uh, deserves a lot of credit for uh, his leadership. And he came to the table when the Palestinians refused to come to the table. We put out a vision for peace. President Abbas decided to stay home. And then you had uh, MBZ come to the table and we were able to negotiate an agreement and broker a peace. One of the things that I think was critical to this is we were able to help bring together our Gulf partners and Israel to organize them to counter the common enemy of Iran. And the prior administration took a different approach. They decided to accommodate Iran. And as a consequence, that alienated uh, our natural partners in the region. And as I've got, gotten around the Middle East, what I hear repeatedly from our partners is that the Iran nuclear deal and America's policy toward Iran was a betrayal. And that's something which I heard from Israel, Saudi, UAE, Bahrain. These are America's longstanding partners in the region. And when we don't stand with them, uh, and defend our own interests, we lose trust. And so when we came into office, we were able to rebuild trust on the basis of countering Iran. And that was a really good platform for us to bring together the Arabs and the Israelis. And so one nice thing I'll say about Iran's foreign policy is that it brought together the Arabs and the Israelis in very new ways. And Iran overplayed its hand. Iran overplayed its hand in the Middle East. And you know, our Gulf partners in the region like Saudi and UAE uh, have been under threat because Iran has organized, trained and equipped the Houthis on Saudi's southern flank. And that is a real threat. And it's also against America's interest to have essentially um, Hezbollah in Yemen, right on Saudi's border. And it gives them the ability to strike at Riyadh and also to reach uh, places like Abu Dhabi and Dubai. So, I'm hopeful that more countries are going to normalize with Israel and we're going to see more countries that will follow. And maybe that's a natural segue to the question about Saudi Arabia. Um, I was on the first flight, the El Al, the Israeli airline flight uh, from Israel to UAE. Um, we flew over Saudi airspace. We flew right over Riyadh and we met with um, the Saudis the next, uh, next day or two. And Saudi Arabia announced that it would be granting permanent overflight rights uh, for those trips. And when you see that sort of thing happening, it's historic. I mean, I was on Air Force One when we flew from Riyadh to Tel Aviv. Uh, I was also on the first flight with Secretary Pompeo from Tel Aviv to Khartoum, Sudan. These are all historic firsts. This is the new Middle East. And I think it's changing um, right before our very eyes. And I think the momentum in the Middle East is starting to be around countries that are tolerant, that invest in the future,
that invest in their own people, that are trying to minimize sectarian violence. They're trying to separate sort of church from state. Iran, you look across the Gulf and you look at Iran over the last 41 years and you compare it to places like Qatar and UAE and Saudi and Bahrain and Oman, and you get the feeling that the Iranian people have been robbed of decades of progress. And it's unacceptable to them. And so I think you're going to see over time a more representative government in Iran. You're going to see a more tolerant Middle East because they're tired of the sectarian violence. That is great news for America's foreign policy because it means that we have to do less in the region. There'll be more burden sharing and it allows us to have a sort of a deeper force posture in the Asia Pacific. Well, now I'm going to actually turn it over to my colleague, Viraj, who is actually on the line calling in. He's going to ask you one follow on question before we resume our conversation. So, Viraj, over to you. Hi, thanks, Lima. And uh, thanks again, Brian, for, for joining the session today. So I have a follow up on sanctions. Uh, you know, I cover the energy sector and particularly the, the global oil majors. And I speak to the management teams. They talk a lot about consistency, consistency, consistency through election cycles. And obviously, they tend to prefer operating in stable environments. You know, on the surface, the two administrations going forward, um, the view on sanctions, particularly on Iran, look quite different. Um, I was wondering if, if from your point of view, would you expect there to be any sort of similarities or middle ground between the two administrations, um, particularly Iran, but also maybe you can comment on Russia. Uh, both of those markets are you know, still important for oil and gas markets uh, over the medium term. So any thoughts on that would be appreciated. Well, with <clears throat> we certainly don't face a tight energy uh, market um, with Brent in, you know, around $40. So we're at a period where even though 3% of the world's oil supply has been effectively removed from the global energy, uh, energy supply, um, it hasn't really had much of an effect. So if an administration comes in and decides to lift sanctions, oil sanctions on Iran, that would allow essentially 2.7 million barrels of oil to go back into the global oil markets that may have the effect of depressing prices further than they already are. Um, from what I've read, from what little I've read on the Biden approach, um, they still very much support the Iran nuclear deal. And that was a key difference in approaches between Democrats and Republicans. Although you did have Democrats like <clears throat> Senator Schumer, Senator Menendez and others, Elliot Engel in the House who opposed uh, the nuclear deal at the time that it was being uh, implemented. And so even on the Democrat side, there isn't full consistency. After it was done, they decided to <clears throat> essentially start supporting it. But I think um, with, with President Trump, if there is a reelect and we are able to get to a new deal that accomplishes America's national security objectives, and also helps advance the security and stability of the Middle East, you will see sanctions relief, <clears throat> especially if we're able, the administration is able to get to no enrichment. Uh, that would be a key factor. And so the, the offer that Secretary Pompeo made in, in 2018, and uh, Halima mentioned this earlier, there's this list of 12 demands. And those demands essentially inform the kind of negotiating objectives the president will take walking into a, negotiating, a, a negotiation with the Iranian regime. If we're able to accomplish those objectives, the president is prepared to end all sanctions on Iran, to normalize relations, to exchange ambassadors, and to open up embassies, and to welcome the Iranian people into the international community. But we first have to get into a much different place with the Iranian regime and their desire to have a nuclear capability, to have an ICBM, to keep funding terrorist groups like <clears throat> Hezbollah, Palestine Islamic Jihad, Hamas, Shia proxies in Iraq and Syria, the Houthis in Yemen. These are the kinds of behaviors that need to change in the region. Um, I, I, so that's my sense. I think if you get a deal in either administration, you are going to see fairly significant sanctions relief. 
It's going to allow Iran to probably to increase its oil exports, uh, and that will have a consequence for energy markets. So Brian, I'm gonna actually ask a follow-up on Viraj's excellent question. I'm reading Dan Jurgen's book. I'm reading, as I mentioned before we came on, Dan Jurgen's book and the new James Baker biography. And in Dan Jurgen's new book, he talks about Yamal LNG, this big Russian gas project. And he essentially says, Yamal LNG, the fact that it was able to come to fruition shows that essentially there are limits to US sanctions pressure. And I'm just, frequently we have the questions come up of, if there is such a heavy reliance on sanctions and unilateral US sanctions, do you essentially get more workaround arrangements where you get you know, big deals that don't involve US dollars? Like how concerned are you that essentially an overuse of sanctions can basically lead to new projects that are circumventing the dollar and the diminishing effectiveness of sanctions? So I've been working on sanctions since probably, um, well, the, <laughs> During the Bush administration, going back to 2006. You are the sanctions man. I know. Yes. I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting old. I'm getting old. But in, um, I, I remember working on, I ran the sanctions office at the U.S. mission to the United Nations. And so I was the lead negotiator yeah. for all of the uh, U.N. Security Council resolutions that would put sanctions. Uh, I was the lead negotiator for the first U.N. sanctions on Iran and the first U.N. sanctions on North Korea. Also worked on places like Sudan during the genocide in Darfur and some other things. Even back then, I was reading about this argument that America should be careful about the overuse of sanctions because it, it could have effects uh, on the dollar. We have national security objectives that promote international peace and security. And America does lead the world in that category. Part of the reason that we have been so successful is because we use our enormous economic leverage to advance our national security objectives. And if you go back to the time of the founding of the United States during Washington's presidency, there has always been a very tight sort of link between our economics and our national security. And you saw that when the Barbary pirates were taking hostage a number of Americans who were on ships that had lost the protection of the British Navy. And uh, George Washington took an entirely different approach to these things than countries like France and Britain. He refused to pay tribute. We were able to pull together a Navy and we were able to then not pay these sorts of ransoms and tribute that was a feature of foreign policy at the time and took a very tough approach. That continued for hundreds of years. And I see nothing to suggest that the United States is going to stop using sanctions as a tool to keep Americans safe because of a concern about the overuse of sanctions. I think it's something that we ought to be aware of, but our toolkit, our diplomatic toolkit, no one in the world has what we have. That ability to essentially collapse an economy like Iran so that it doesn't have the revenue that it needs to fund terrorist groups like Hezbollah. So prior to 9-11, no terrorist group had killed more Americans in the world than Hezbollah. Iran has been funding 70% of Hezbollah's budget during its entire existence, going back to the early 80s. And so this has real world consequences to helping save American lives when Hezbollah is broke. And the leader of Hezbollah um, in March of last year had to go on a fundraising campaign, first time in Hezbollah's history, where they had to make essentially a, a fundraising appeal. And they, they would put these little banks and grocery stores asking people for spare change. And there were billboards up asking people to text money uh, to Hezbollah. And it's because Iran doesn't have the money that it used to. That's an important thing. When Shia proxies in Iraq don't have the kind of training, weapons, and money to execute terrorist operations against coalition forces in Iraq, that is an important thing, and our sanctions make a lot of that possible. And so I think we ought to continue with our policy of using our economic leverage to advance our national security objectives. If we don't use it, if we decided, well, we really shouldn't put any economic pressure on Iran because it may have other consequences uh, monetary consequences, we are putting American lives at risk. Uh, 
And that's not a theoretical or sort of abstract concern. It's a very real world concern. Well, I'm going to pivot now as in our sort of closing minutes of our conversation to that, again, the second book I was reading, the James Baker biography. And, you know, he served in so many Republican administrations. And you share that. I mean, you served, as you talked about, you were an intern for Bush 41. You served in a variety of posts in Bush 43. You know, you were working under Tillerson and Pompeo. You also worked under Bolton. I wonder if you can talk about this as an arc of Republican foreign policy and how you see the differences in approach between Trump administration, the two previous Bush administrations, and where does it go if we get a second Trump administration or if it's a Biden administration? What is the sort of the Trump doctrine? Well, I think the Trump doctrine, he has quoted Reagan's peace through strength. He very much believes in a military capability that is second to none and is a military capability that is itself a deterrent, that it um, causes people to rethink the cost benefit of going toe to toe with the United States. And that's why the president has invested so much uh, money in uh, improving uh, America's force posture, modernizing our military, enhancing our cyber capabilities. Also uh, in space, uh, that is obviously a frontier that China and Russia are very interested in. We need to win as we did uh, during the Cold War, going back to John Kennedy, uh, announcing the objective of going to the moon. So uh, there's gonna be continued leadership in space, in cyber, in conventional force capabilities around a very strong Air Force, a very strong Navy that, 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 that does freedom of navigation operations all over the Asia Pacific. You're gonna see that continue. Um, the president also, I think, uh, uh, this part of, of Republican foreign policy of peace through strength is going to continue, I think, across administrations, a deep, uh, a deep appreciation for America's military uh, capabilities, um, doing what we can to integrate economics and national security. Uh, this president has made our China policy very tightly knit, um, sort of the, the economic approach to China walks arm in arm with our defense strategy uh, with respect to China. He's taken a whole of government approach. I do think this great power competition with China is probably the number one issue. Um, that is going to endure, regardless of who's in the White House, not only in the next term, but in successive terms. And it's going to be ma managing that relationship successfully that I think is going to be the test uh, for whether presidents fail or succeed. Um, so that's broadly, I, uh, as, as I look at it, I think, going, you mentioned Jim Baker, um, who was Reagan's chief of staff. Um, I think... The Reagan approach to international affairs is going to continue in the Republican Party. And so uh, there'll be variants on it. But as I look over the last um, 40 years or so, I think you're probably going to see Reagan's foreign policy still being quoted and cited. You're going to see President Trump's foreign policy of championing America championing American industry, manufacturing American jobs. That's going to continue. Uh, that is certainly an enormous contribution that he made to America's foreign policy, helping people understand that on international economics, a rising tide did not lift all boats. And whether it's rust belts in the UK that brought about Brexit or rust belts in the United States that people like Donald Trump and Rick Santorum tapped into when they were running for president. That's going to continue. Uh, so those are some of the features as I look at it uh, that are probably going to continue in a second term and beyond in a Republican Party. And just as a, you know, a quick follow up on that, because again, you were in the, the Bush administration and the Iraq war, and we had you know, the, the whole effort on you know, democratization in the Arab world. I think about Condi Rice's really seminal speech in Cairo. Um, has that been repudiated? Because you talked about sort of the human rights component when we think about China or North Korea. Has the Republican Party sort of walked away from that sort of Cairo speech, that emphasis on you know, democracy and human rights when it 
other regions of the world. I think the contrast is probably with President Trump's speech in Riyadh. Uh, that was his first trip overseas as president, was to Saudi Arabia. And the Riyadh speech I've read many times, I encourage people to take a, another look at that. I think that that's much more likely to be uh, the foreign policy of the Republican Party uh, more than the Cairo speech. Uh, I think what you saw in the Riyadh speech was an emphasis on shared interests, that we're going to work together on the basis of shared interests. Uh, we do speak out on foreign rights. And if you look at um, the Human Rights Report that the State Department publishes annually, we don't pull any punches on human rights uh, in the Gulf you are going to see, I think, a more narrow focus on interests. Uh, and that's going to be primary. And then there's going to be, I think, a desire to promote human rights, but it's not going to be something that America leads with. Because when you look, you know, President Trump talked about this in the campaign. You know, we spent trillions of dollars in the Middle East. We lost a lot of Americans fighting in the Middle East. And whether it's President Obama or President Trump, you have had now 12 years of, of, an, of wanting to end endless wars. There's just no appetite for nation building in the Middle East anymore. And I think that that is probably a chapter that's going to be closed. We're going to continue to defend our interests there. We're going to, I think, demand more burden sharing from the region. Israel has really risen in an extraordinary way. And I think Israel can be part of the uh, security umbrella for the region. Because today, the biggest threat in the Middle East today is Iran's foreign policy. And Israel, UAE, Saudi, Bahrain, and other countries feel the immediate and clear and danger threat that Iran presents. So Israel is now a big part of that. And as Israel's economy gets bigger, bigger, they're the Silicon Valley of the Middle East. As their economy grows, their, their military capabilities grow, that's all very good for the United States long term because it reduces our burden in the region. And it's been enormous from the time that we took over from the British after their British mandate ended in the region. And then we've largely been... Uh, the lead country in the Middle East now since the mid-40s. We have to do it in a way that doesn't cost trillions of dollars and thousands of American lives. And I think President Trump has had an enormously successful uh, foreign policy in the Middle East. He defeated ISIS very quickly. Uh, he took on extremism, whether it's Sunni or Shia. He restored trust with our partners in the region. And he set out a vision that I think is going to allow us to keep a lid on a region that has a history of boiling over. And it's going to be at less cost and at less risk of American lives. And those are very good things for the American people. And in the final moments that we have, I have just uh, in five minutes, if you can just reflect on the, sort of the arc of your career, what, what, what are you most proud of? I think I know the answer to that. But really, what was your, what was your biggest challenge? And what did you learn from that? Well, I think it's hard to beat um, being a part of the of the team that negotiated two peace treaties in 30 days, uh, Arab peace treaties with Israel. I think it was 24 years uh, between the Jordan's treaty with Israel and the United Arab Emirates uh, peace agreement. It was 24 years in between. We were able to then do one treaty, a peace agreement, and then within 30 days we did another. Uh, I think you saw yesterday that President Trump announced that Sudan is uh, going to be putting money into escrow accounts that's going to go to the families, the victims of terrorism in America. And in exchange, that's going to get Sudan off the state sponsor of terrorism list. I went with Secretary Pompeo to Khartoum. We had very good conversations there. You look at a number of countries in the region um, that, that we hope over time are going to normalize with Israel. And so being a part of the effort that Jared Kushner has led uh, so masterfully um, I'm hopeful that we are seeing the beginning of the end of the Arab-Israeli conflict. And so to be a part of that, I have a great deal of pride. The president showed great vision. If you read the Riyadh speech, he talks about wanting to create new agreements in the region. And he's done that. You can draw a straight line from the Riyadh speech to the two peace agreements we were able to negotiate very recently. 
I was able to negotiate. I, I conducted secret talks with the Iranians through the Swiss that that um, was able to negotiate the release of two Americans that were held in Iranian prison. Uh, one's home in California and the other one's home in Princeton uh, with their families. And so that feels very good. Um, I, I've made a big focus in my career on alliance building. So when I was in policy planning, I, I went very deep on India. I think India is the biggest return on investment that America can make in its foreign policy. Um, especially, we can take advantage of China, China's mistakes on India to bring India closer to the United States. We have a lot of the same values. It's the world's largest democracy. It's got so many great capabilities. President Trump and Prime Minister Modi have a superb working relationship. You saw that in Texas at the Howdy Modi when they filled the stadium. But, yeah, but, but Prime Minister Modi comes to New York and he fills Madison Square Garden. This is such an opportunity for the United States. And so I, I want us to pull India in closer. When I look at the Indo-Pacific, I very much like this quadrilateral grouping of the United States, Japan, India, and Australia. That ought to be the four, the four pillars of the Indo-Pacific. And and then you also have a number of what there's like 35 countries in the Indo-Pacific. We ought to be, and what I've tried to do is really deepen our alliances economically on defense, di on diplomacy, cultural exchanges, all of the above. That I think is um, the free and open Indo-Pacific, I think is a, is a organizing principle um, that I'm very proud of having worked on uh, coming into the administration. The president and the secretary of state have done a good job of building out the free and open Indo-Pacific, but that's where we need to be, I think, investing a lot of our time and energy, and especially in India. And your la in the last minute, Brian Hook, what was your biggest challenge or setback that you faced? You're not getting away without answering that one. <laughs> well, gee, um, that's a, it's a good question. Um, I try to focus on accomplishments. I think the biggest challenge <laughs> I would say this. I would say here's the. This is a. a, a this is a, the best answer I can give to a difficult question. I think the Iranian regime has been so successful for so long, over 41 years, running its um, its sort of nuclear program, the missile program, the proxy warfare, the hostage taking. I think that a lot of countries have lost the ability to imagine an Iran at peace with its neighbors. And I think that they assume that Iran's behavior is part of the natural order. And I really wish that a number of countries, especially those in Western Europe, would do a better job of standing up to Iran and holding it accountable. Um, I, I think that the Iran nuclear deal has come at the expense of peace and stability in the region. I have to remind people the Iran nuclear deal is temporary. It has already started expiring. Uh, the missile restrictions expired in October. Um, I'm sorry, the arms embargo and some of the missile restrictions expired in October. So the Iranian challenge is a very significant one. It's been at enormous cost to uh, American blood and treasure. We need more partners uh, standing with us to stand up to the Iranian regime. And if you can imagine a more peaceful Iran, the Middle East starts to look very different. If Iran could be at peace with its neighbors instead of constantly at war, if we could imagine Iran's proxies kind of no longer operational and rich with cash, and we've done an enormous job of denting that operation, the Middle East, I think, is when you look at the, the hopefulness we're seeing in the region, if we could then marry some of that hopefulness I described in the Gulf. Um, look, everywhere Iran has deep, deep ties, you have failed states. Places like Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq, and Iran, these are all countries that are struggling enormously. You look south and you look at the Gulf, that's where the energy and the future and the vibrancy is. And so I think if Iran can be at peace with its neighbors and Europe can do a better job of, of advancing that objective, the Middle East is going to be in a much better place. So that's probably the challenge I've thought about the most. Well, Brian Hook, I just can't thank you enough for joining us today. You bet. Um, as I've said to so many clients, you know, the reason you want to listen to Brian Hook, and I know you don't like this term, but I really do think of you as sort of like now 
I like the establishment of the Republican Party and foreign policy. You have I, I can only think of people like Elliot Abrams that have really served now in more administrations. And so I feel like we will be seeing you at some point over the next four years if we get a second Trump administration. If we get a Biden administration, I think we will be seeing you back in power several years later. So again, Brian Hook, again, we thank everybody for their service and we look forward to watching the further trajectory of your career. So thank you so much. Those are very kind words. I don't merit any of them, but I really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, thanks for uh, taking an interest in all of these issues and I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you so much, Brian Hook. Have a wonderful day. Okay, you too. And everyone on the, the line, I want to tell you that we are closing out this iteration of Beyond the Ballot. Next week, we will be having Ambassador Victoria Nuland wrap up our series as we head into the presidential election. So thank everyone for being on the line. And again, thank you, Brian Hook. Have a great day, everyone. This content is based on information available at the time it was recorded and is for informational purposes only. It is not an offer to buy or sell or a solicitation, and no recommendations are implied. It is outside the scope of this communication to consider whether it is suitable for you and your financial objectives.